pleasure to of UC Santa Cruz, who will tell us today about the title of his talk is From Symplectic Topology to Dynamics of Logical Entropy. Thank you very much. It's my first deep, uh, I would say, the US in uh, when in nearly three years, and I'm hugely excited to be here. It's nice to start with a good secret. So I'm going to talk uh, about um, an interaction, fact of interaction between symplectic topology and dynamics, and uh, mainly it will be based on a recent joint work with Herman Winnick. <laughs> well, I mean, I will try to write as little as possible, but this is something I should do a bit more. Yes, but I think this is not the right misspell. Misspell is what she really knows. It's it's no. No. <laughs> <laughs> so no, 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 And symplectic topology. And by dynamics, I really mean dynamics. Things like topological entropy or ergodicity, uh, things that go beyond the work. So, in here, I'm going to focus on topological entropy. All the uh, similar questions can be asked uh, about. Uh, are they interesting dynamics in back? And by synthetic topology, I'm going to uh, mean mainly Fleur's theory. I'm going to spell out what I mean by that shortly. Um, here to start with, I can just say that synthetic topology is actually an offspring of dynamics, but uh, that happened very long time ago, and since then, actually, the two areas went their uh, separate ways. Um, there are actually remarkably few applications of synthetic topology of work to dynamics questions beyond periodic orders, but there are still some, like by um, Popper and uh, his collaborator. Kulterovich and his school, Victor Boa, um, Alves and Marvis, Christopher Gardner, and Spindinian Humidor. But overall, there are rather few. So I'm going to focus on. So the book here is Can I see topological entropy from the symplectic topology side from the first theory? Uh, in Spanish. So let me spell out what I mean by that. Uh, here's the second. We are going to start with that closely <coughs> synthetic name. So it's a manifold with a close to one. <laughs> In addition, this two form is uh, non degenerate so it's no way zero. And such a form locally in some coordinate Q1 through here, Q1 through QN has uh, the form DPI, DQI. This is what's known as the Darko theorem, and 
M here is the free space, and the evolution of the system is given by a function, the energy, which depends on time and without lot of generality, we can assume that it's actually periodic in time. Such a function gives rise to a vector field at stage for the Newtonian vector field, which is determined by the condition that I take this vector field, field feed it to the symplectic form and get the negative Newtonian uh, negative uh, differential of each with respect to the squeeze form. In local core, uh, in, in coordinates P and Q, XH is simply given by the condition that uh, P dot is partial H partial Q, and Q dot is partial H partial P, and there is a negative sign. And this is uh, the classical Hamilton equation. So this whole setup generalizes the setting of classical uh, mechanics and what shall be added to it an example an example here would be for instance we can take a surface with a with an area having a vector field on the plus manifold I'm getting a flow out of it of time dependent flow because the vector field is actually time dependent. I don't know who, uh, who invented this terminology, the time dependent flow. Um, I mean, and I thought it starts with the identity and then it proceeds with time. And the time one map uh, of this isotopy is called a Newtonian integral. So it has an important property that it preserves this form and therefore it preserves the volume, but it's more than just the volume preserving for synthetic map. For instance, if I take a torus with the standard area form and translation along one of the coordinates or rotation along one of the coordinates, it will be simulated, but not the So this is a more We are interested in the dynamics of such a Now, the next ingredient here I need to explain is fluidity. What distinguishes synthetic topology framework is that one can study, at least one can study the periodic orbits of um, such Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms by using methods beyond uh, classical dynamics or beyond that. Namely, let's look at the fixed points of a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. These are the same as one periodic orbits of the isotopy. So here is the point P. It moves under the flow and then come back to the initial position in times in time one. So what Florent did, he said that 
one can take these fixed points of one periodic orbits and organize them in a complex or a suitable uh, chosen field. It's called the floor complex. <clears throat> So the dimension of this complex is exactly the number of the fixed points. And there is a differential here, which absolutely immaterial for us. And therefore, there is a homology, which is called the word homology of This is done similarly to uh, the classical Morse theory for in the finite dimensional setting or for uh, geodesics, uh, although technically it's more difficult. And then he proved the theorem, or at least proved the following theorem in many uh, situations. That the fluor homology of phi is equal to the homology of the underlying manifold with coefficients in that field. The corollary of that theorem is the is Arnold's conjecture. Which says that at least under uh, some non degeneracy conditions, the dimension of the complex, which is the number of the fixed points, is bounded from below by the sum of the petty numbers of the name. So, this is in a nutshell what uh, what it is. Yes. Uh, looking at this picture, where uh, the first thing to observe that it's an incredibly robust machine. Uh, the left hand side here is something depending on fact, but as a matter of fact, it's totally uh, it's totally independent. It depends only on the face case. So this is the machinery which tells you something extremely important, but it tells you the same thing about all the Newtonian Kind of from that perspective, it's something incredibly important. Like it, it tells you, uh, it repeats itself all the time. So, and this is the uh, reason can be personal. It's very robust, but it's not particularly discriminating. Um, for instance, if I'm interested in how the in the dynamics of phi, so what happens when I take phi and then start iterating it, phi squared, phi cubed, etc. Uh, this machine on this part does not actually tell me anything interesting because like phi, phi squared, etc., it's, it's all the same thing. So uh, when we get to, um, for instance, it's not immediately clear uh, when and under uh, what conditions the set of Key periodic orbit changes or grows under iterations. So that's um, kind of one of the questions um, the machinery does not answer on this. Overall, it's actually good, and this is a um, recurrent uh, thing here. It's good at determining things that happen on conditions. 
happen all this and um, much less adept at uh, detecting sort of conditions such that I don't know entropy or things dynamics happening in a small piece. Or I don't know if Newtonian dichromatism may happen to uh, have an uh, we happen to have interesting dynamic or not. So this is uh, a conditional thing and it's not so uh, good. So uh, the second ingredient here I'm talking about is topological entropy and most of the people here probably know more about it than I do. So but nonetheless, let me say a few words. By the way, are there any questions? Okay. So feel free to interrupt me. Questions? Let's say you have a compact metric space. And the homeomorphism, or even just a smooth map from M to itself. <laughs> then you have the topological entity of that map. This is a number from zero to infinity. Possibly including infinity in general, uh, which measures uh, the complexity of that map in a rather simple way. Let's look at, let's take two points, X and Y, and start creating their orbits. X, phi of X, then phi of X squared, then likewise for Y. This orbit might or not diverge. So to measure that, we will orbit, uh, form a metric, G sub K between X and Y, which is just the maximum of pairwise distances between A and the i ranges between k minus one and zero, starting with x and y, and then I'm taking g of x and y of this distance, that distance, that, and that, and then the maximum. So this is an increasing or non decreasing sequence of metrics and the entropy, so the diameter of M doesn't change, but the distance between any two points can grow. So I want to know how many points in M I can picture up to an epsilon R. There are different ways to make it precise. For instance, we can look at as epsilon sub k, this is the maximum cardinality of an the maximum cardinality of an epsilon separated set. So I can look at C epsilon sub k, which is the size of the minimum covered by epsilon d sub k wolf and see how this quantities grow or change as k goes to infinity. I'm looking at the growth of the exponential scale, so I'm going to 
the first of all, I'm going to take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Then I'm going to take the limit for the upper limit of say as k goes to infinity. And then I'm going to get the exponential growth rate of any of these two numbers, log of as epsilon of k divided by k or with the c epsilon and uh, I can do a similar thing. Here I can take just the limit because it exists. Yes, I said it, but I did not write it down. So this is the maximal, the maximal cardinality of the epsilon separated set with respect to G T K, and this is the mean, the minimal cardinality of a cover by epsilon decay box sets of diameter less. So I'm getting this number, it can be zero, it can be infinite. And it has some natural properties which more or less readily follow from the definitions. For instance, um, it's independent of the metric. Secondly, it's bounded from above by the dimension of M to be more precise, the box dimension times the log of the Lipschitz constant. So if the map phi has a little bit of smoothness, then the entropy is uh, fine. And Secondly, it can be local or it is localized. If y in the m is invariant, then the entropy, sorry, the entropy of phi is bounded from below by the entropy of its restriction to y. It's enough to have entropy somewhere, and then it will make phi to have a positive So, a trivial example if phi is autonomous, the Newtonian Dicamar is an in n dimension two. So back to the settings we had in here on the previous set of boards where uh, it's a Hamiltonian dicamorphism on the symplectic manifold and that manifold happens to be a surface, then the topological entities. And something to keep in mind for the future use that entropy is in general not directly related to the growth of periodic orbits. Beyond dimension two, you can have the number of periodic orbits growing super exponentially, and uh, but the uh, entropy being zero and the other way around. So beyond dimension two, there is no no direct connection between the two. This uh, this statement you put on board is only true in dimension two. It's only true in dimension two. Just uh, think in think of of the mapping to us, right? Or now, uh, of course, we are we are not interested in this. I mean, zero is a very interesting number, but. It's not what I want to talk about. Very really interesting in uh, arithmetic. And there are two sources of positive identity. At least two sources. Uh, maybe more. 
So one of them is global topological behavior. Of let's say global topology. An example is let's look at the remember in the background we have an isotope ultimate. Let's look at the number of three homotopic classes populated by periodic orbit of the isotope on the iteration. This number can grow. It can even grow exponentially. And if it grows exponentially, um, you have positive entropy. This is something which is well known for, uh, say, geodesic uh, flow, particularly for geodesic flows on uh, many forms of negative curvature, where it happens inevitably and that's quite easily by. Uh, in this, in that second, you have uh, positive so exponential growth of three uh, homotopy. Been extensively studied, and it's still very much in the center of uh, some applications of uh, some topology. Another source is the action of the uh, of phi on the uh, homology. Namely, let's look at the map phi induces on the homology of the manifold. This is a linear map. It has a spectral radius. And the spectral radius has a log. And this thing bounds from below the topological entity. Okay. This is a celebrated theorem of your. For instance, let's take a matrix in SL and Z. It induces a map of the n dimensional torus to itself. Then the then I can look at the sum of the logs of the eigenvalues. Let's take the eigenvalues. Outside the unit circle, then this sum bounds from below the topological entropy of this map. In fact, you have an equality of the map is uh, so. This is like a global, a couple of global sources of topological entropy. But then, as I said, it can be localized and. An example of a local source is a function. Let me recall uh, what I mean by that. Let's take the metric space of by sequences of zeros and ones. Uh, and the map I want to consider is the is a shift in the right or left shift that does not matter. So if you take a sequence AI and you apply the shift, it just moves it one 
step take to the left. Then it's pretty much immediate to their calculation that the topological entropy of this matrix called the Bernoulli shift is equal to the log of two. And uh, it's convenient. Well, here they got to be consistent with all the logs. Usually we take log of two, base two, sorry. Now, um, There is nothing wrong here, but what turns out is that oftentimes, for many, let's say, for many maps, we have an invariant set, an invariant invariant of uh, this counter set lambda in the M such that the restriction of phi to uh, lambda is the uh, dimension. And so, because the entropy can be localized, we immediately have that the um, entropy of uh, phi is bounded from below by the topological energy of the knowledge, which is one with our conventions. And this can happen in an arbitrarily small disk or arbitrarily small uh, ball. So you don't need any global topology for that. It's a purely local phenomenon. So it can be purely local phenomenon. And moreover, Kato, I think in the early 80s, showed that in, in dimension two, all the entropy comes from, uh, from something like these hyperbolic sets, these horseshoes. In other words, if you have a map with a positive entropy, then it has something like a horseshoe with, uh, with the entropy arbitrarily close to that. Okay, it's the only source. Uh, and this is the type of phenomenon that I'm interested in. Uh, as I said, sort of global sources of topological entropy in symplectic topology has been started in through, the, um, through uh, mainly most recently the work of Alves. And here we are interested in detecting uh, local sources of topological entropy. And to do so, we need to talk about another feature of uh, first theory, which I have so far left out. And this has to do with action protection. Let's go back to this second when we have the symplectic manifold. When we have a Newtonian diffeomorphism, it's generated by a 
Newtonian coming from uh, a function on this one cross M. And then I'm going to cheat a little bit. One can associate to any loop in M the action of H on this loop. And what I'm saying is not literally true, but it's good enough for our purpose. So assume for the sake of simplicity that this loop is contained in a ball so that there the symmetric form is exact. It is a differential of, uh, of some one form lambda. For instance, it's in one of the coordinate charts where it is dpdq, so I can take pdq. Then the action of h on x is the negative integral of lambda over x plus the integral of h along the x. And in particular, for every one periodic orbit of phi, I have the action of x defined. Then it turns out that the differential, remember the Euler complex comes with the with the difference. The differential is action decrease. So if dx is the sum with some coefficients, some non-zero coefficients, ax, y, and then I can work with y, then the action of y is strictly smaller than the action of x. So in particular, I can look at the part of the complex generated by orbits with action less than A. And this will be a subcomplex. And if you have a homology, Which, in contrast with the global floor homology, depends on what phi and a. So now it is actually an invariant that can, can capture something. And I can try to understand how it changes when a increases from something like very small to very large. Well, this is an increasing family of subcomplexes. So there is a map induced by the inclusion between the subcomplex less than or equal to A and the, the homology of the subcomplex less than or equal to B. And this map. The, and this inclusion has uh, all the naturally expected properties. Whenever you have such a structure, such a family of spaces, um, there is a whole theory about how to deal with it. And we, we can, you know, the most of you know much more about it than I do. And this machine is called persistence. <coughs> modules. Basically, it tracks how homology classes are, are born and killed in uh, 
as the A grows from negative infinity to positive infinity. And, and it's easier to explain this by an example. And just to give you the gist of it, let's take this hard shape sphere with the height function. On it, what? What? It looks like box. You. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have to think of it again. Well, okay. Um, whatever this thing is, let's. Uh, look at the kind of function right? and see, see how the life of the F, so how the homology of the subset of less than we equal three uh, changes. So, uh, for a while, as the A is below this level, I have nothing, then. Uh, then I acquire a point, and this point stays there. This is the uh, homology class uh, of a point, and it never disappears. So it stays in the homology class. Then there is a settle. So a new homology class is created. But this class is relatively short. Once I hit the first maximum, something kills it. It disappears. And then nothing new happens for a while. And finally, I arrive at the largest maximum. And at this moment, the fundamental class is created. So this bar indicate the creation and disappearance of uh, homology classes. So this is the point, this is the short lived saddle, and uh, this is the fundamental class. So I have two infinite bars here and one finite. The same thing can be done um, for any sequence of vector spaces or um, filtered complexes as long as some natural conditions are set. Now this machine has been, I don't know who to attribute it to, probably Carlson and the modern and uh, Chazelle and Vidor. In the context of synthetic topology, it was Polterovich and Shilukin, I think, who like uh, first brought it to work on in our work here. So, whenever we have a Newtonian TFMR field, we can associate to it what we call a barcode. And for our purposes, uh, this is just an unordered set of intervals or rather actually not full intervals but simply their lengths. So if this are uh, intervals a i b i very interested in numbers a i minus b i minus a i which is something between zero and infinity. So they interested in the interlengths of this. And so let's, let's give it an attention for it V of five. Observe that the number of this number V of five. The number of bars comes from below the number of generators in the complex. 
uh, up to the dimension of the homology, it actually depends on one half. Because there are some infinite parts which uh, correspond to uh, the global homology classes, and then there are higher. All right, now I'm in a position to give a key definition. So I have my Newton and Diffie markings. And I can look, I can take any epsilon greater than zero and look at the number of bars. <coughs> with length greater than x. Overall, this is a totally intractable number. There is absolutely no way to tell what it is in any kind of uh, minimally non-trivial example. Uh, it's absolutely impossible to understand. This number, however, depends on time. And I'm going to introduce the following object. The barcode entropy of phi is well, it's very similar to uh, uh, the topological entropy of phi. I'm going to send epsilon to zero, then send the order of iterations to infinity, pick the log, the number of bars of the lens greater than epsilon of the iterative map divided by. So here, what I have here bounds from below the log of the number of generators. But it can, so, uh, so some trade-off happens here. Uh, on the one hand, this may be much smaller than the number of generators. But in some sense, it, it bounds the number of gen generators from below in a very stable way. I changed this thing a little bit. The number of generators can change a lot, but this number does. I'm not going to elaborate on that, but this is a very um, important feature for the proofs. Uh, This is kind of identical to the almost identical to the formula you have. How much can it be? It's very identical. There is a very peculiar difference here. So the topological entropy can be defined in several similar ways with slightly different properties. And because of that, you can actually just from the definition say a lot about it. For instance, I don't know. It's homogeneous, it's uh, additive on the uh, cross products, etc. Nothing like that you can do here. It's kind of, there's almost nothing you can say about uh, the behavior of this thing. Or far squares? Well, you see, it's impossible to tell how these guys change as. Uh, there it is, you have a sequence of metric spaces, they sort of with. The same set with a sequence of increasing metrics. Uh, so, so you can see it is some. Here, like there is a, a, no practical relation, at least not that we, we, we would know of uh, uh, between these numbers, the scale changes. So th th there is very little difference. All right. So uh, you're somehow in the periodic orbits, but somehow pairs of periodic orbits that are. Formologically related to one another. Um, I'm still, yeah. Uh, I can probably, I can do a little bit better. So, 
That's my way of periodic orbits here, but uh, I don't want to go into it. It's kind of, it, it doesn't bring much to the table, at least at the moment. So I want to speak. I have something like 10 minutes left. Uh, so I want to speak our experience and I find that. Uh, It's uh, this result are joined with Arman and Tasha. Here, 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 is bounded from the here, by the here, uh, here, is an interesting immediate consequence of uh, that theory, which is non orbit namely the number of bars bounded from the wall by epsilon grows at most exponential. At the same time, the number of generators, the number of periodic orbits, already in dimension two can grow uh, uh, arbitrarily fast. So that means that uh, most of them will get shorter and shorter, super exponentially shorter. This is Asaoka and uh, and Zurai. We see the result of that. But what if the boat bender is infinite? No, it cannot be infinite in the smooth case. It's bounded by the dimension times the log of the Lipschitz constant. The barcode is still defined for homeomorphism. Uh, I asked you yesterday. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll talk about it some more. Um, so, by the way, all three. Theorems here require, I stated one, uh, require things to, this theorem requires uh, pi to be C infinity. Uh, the next theorem, oh yeah, before I said it. So at this point, it could be still zero for every pi. Uh, so theorem B, let's say, K in M is a hyperbolic set. A proper hyperbolic set. For instance, a horseshoe. Then the topological entries of phi restricted to K is bounded, bounds from below the platform. So it can be positive. I should. So this is really in dimension? In, in dimension? In any dimension. So I should say in the original version, we have an extra assumption which uh, said uh, required key to be uh, locally maximum and uh, provides yet uh, pointed out to us that it's not really necessary. So the corollary. Is uh, in two G the barcode entry is equal to the and this is a consequence of the A and B and the Results of cutoff I have already mentioned that all entropy comes in dimension two comes from hyperbolic sets. Uh, so this is the uh, A, B, and cutoff. Um, uh, say it again. What is the regularity? Okay, so here is infinity. Uh, here I think it's. At least C1 plus epsilon because I, I need cut off. Uh, 
Say it again. You see the below you need like oh, no, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, here, I, here I need more uh, cathode equivalence theorem A, so I don't see infinity again. And in theorem B, I'm not absolutely sure, at least C1. Um, give me a second. Um, I thought it was C infinity, but now I don't remember why it is C infinity. But you need some smoothness here. Probably C1 plus epsilon. Why do I am not 100% sure? Uh, and here is kind of another peculiar consequence of this result. So um, that it's not a direct corollary of the theorem, but of the proof. So let's do this. Let's look at the, let's take the graph of phi k in M cross M. It has a word. It has a, a, a two-dimensional word. And I can take a log of it and divide by k and take the root super again as k plus infinity. I get an invariant of phi, and as a consequence of this theorem, this is actually equal to the topological entropy of phi in. So it, turned, it looks like this might by accident be a new result. There are similar results starting with a paper by Gromov, I think, from the 70s in the homomorphic or algebraic category. But um, here it just seems huge. Uh, by the way, I should say that probably. I have a student looking in the probably under minor conditions, uh, all of this is true for area preserving maps, at least isotopic to their identity. So uh, probably the Hamiltonian condition can be relaxed, although it's still work in progress. But um, in dimension two, this uh, and graph entropy turns out to be equal to the topological entropy and uh, also the Lyapunov entropy. Um, so, um, let me maybe Mention a couple of things I don't have time to uh, talk about uh, proofs, but um, kind of, first of all, a disclaimer. In no way one should think of it, at least at this stage of our knowledge, as a new way to uh, compute the topological end. So, Sophan, I think, asked uh, that question in one of the talks. Like if there is an example where you could do uh, the barcode entropy and, and the, uh, but could not do the topological entropy. So no, uh, it's kind of the only situation where we can prove that the barcode entropy is uh, non-zero is in theorem. It's really you can compete here with. Uh, Dynamics, we just don't know enough uh, at the moment. Um, secondly, I mean, there were some prior results uh, along these lines, um, although they're probably not exactly like that by Alves and uh, Marius and Fumidia and Kanevsky. This is 
pushed up is not uh, quite out of the blue. And let me stop here. Thank you. C'était qui le l'orateur? Victor Ginsburg. Il est euh, de Californie, Santa Barbara ou quelque chose comme non, ça. Non, mais je veux dire, c'est un russe de Californie. Ah. <rire> <rire> Nothing changes. There is no dynamics. But of course, what I could have, what one could do instead, there are tons of situations where this uh, Barcott theory can be applied. There are Reeves complexes. There are many things. You can have a, a sequence of persistent modules, uh, like you can have a sequence of Morse functions. Uh, and then, you can possibly associate to it uh, an entropy-like notion. Uh, I don't know, I have not done it since. You want to get something interesting, right? You want to get something non-zero, uh, something that tells you uh, some interesting relevant information. I simply don't know. But there could be many other situations when you uh, could use the same. Um, the same approach. But you need to have a sequence of things, right? And then uh, to the so for functions, it will be just kind of iteration, uh, I mean, compositions of functions, right? Not in compositions. Like, I have two functions on the same manifold. Uh, um, okay. You have two F3 and four F3. Yeah, you need to have a sequence of things. You need to have some evolution. Something has to, has to be happening. Uh, but you can think this way. You like you have some natural problem. You have something and you are making measurements. This measurement become more and more precise. Uh, you take a many photos, you start randomly putting points there, more and more points, and then you look at the um, and then there is a way, several ways to associate a um, persistence module uh, to the sequence of points. If you take the uh, Morse function on manifold, you look at it as Morse sparkle. Yeah. And then you look at the Morse sparkle, who have three of them so on. It's the same thing. It's the same yeah, thing. Yeah, it's the, 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 this is, a, this is an example where nothing is okay. Uh, but then I don't know, you, you, you can look at sequence of eigenfunctions of your Laplace, right? On the surface of ne negative curvature. And uh, then maybe something is, I mean, you need, to, you need to guess what the interesting uh, framework. I simply don't know. Certainly the same thing can be done in many other settings. Yes, uh, I can. So there is a related notion. Uh, I didn't, it's in our paper, but there is, it's simply there was no time. One can, rather than working with the entire symplectic manifold, you can take a Lagrangian submission. And look at its images under flat. And uh, under suitable extra hypothesis, you will again have a filtered complex associated to it. Um, and you can run all the same process. 
it is a generalization because it is like the same as taking the diagonal of the square and applying uh, the identity times phi. So uh, one, so in the entropy you get will depend on the Lagrangian. So one perspective, and there will be an analog of DMA here. Let me even suggest to write this. And then one can sort of perhaps, and this is like a purely like my wishful thinking, think of it as an analog of metric entropy. And then one can ask things along the lines of the creation of things as well. But again, this is like purely not even hypothesized. But is it positive? You have an example for me? Well, the, 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 the only example I have is the diagram. Hypothetically, it's like, positive for a small neighborhood of a hyperbolic set. Right. But L is a curve, no? No, L doesn't have to be a curve. L, in dimension two? Uh, I, in dimension two, yes, but it doesn't have to be in dimension. If I can take L to be the diagonal in the cross L. So if, if you take all the Lagrangians on the surface, I have no idea whether it's ever positive or not. Hypothetically, it is. We, we could not, in this surface, so hypothetically, if you take uh, something like a homoclinical uh, handle or uh, a neighborhood of a horseshoe, then hypothetically, you will get. Positive entropy, but uh, I don't know. So that's totally open. So, L, you think it as a neighborhood? So it can be an open L, I think what I said is let's let's say you have a question. Let's take the so boundary of a neighborhood. Yeah, let's take the boundary of a small neighborhood of the question. Then I, think, or maybe just take the question. Uh, let's take. Let's say you have the standard horseshoe, right? Let's take the boundary of the square. Then I think there is a very good chance that you are going to get uh, the capital positive entity here, but I don't know. It's, it's a, I have no idea how to prove it. Absolutely. And of our theorem, uh, our proof of theorem B like breaks down. No, no, uh, but I don't expect it to be. I so sort of the, the wildest conjecture we could make is that it, it has a chance to be true generically. In our dimension, you have a you can have positive entropy and zero or no any quadratic point. No, you can uh, not in the Hamiltonian case. In the Hamiltonian case, you always have periodic points. Remember, I mean, I'm not talking about arbitrary maps. I'm talking about mathematics. So, uh, but of course, ultimately, theorem C is based. On periodic orbits, and once we go to higher dimensions, this relation between periodic orbits and entropy becomes too loose, I, too weak. I don't expect this to be true. At least, thank you. Uh huh. At the higher dimension, can you relate the limit of the log of the volume of the graph with the h bar? No, no, in high dimensions you have this by yonder. Yeah. But uh, no. No, no, it actually no. It's kind of it, it uses all, all all of this. It, it ultimately uses like theorem C. So it 
the way it works, or does it bound the no. does it bound each part of the law? Uh, okay. Okay. Let me write that. Let me write it down. So, uh, Roman and Pasha, please do correct me if I need something. Let's give it a name. So this is this is true and ultimate. This is true and ultimate, and this is this is like uh, a part of the proof of theorem X. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is the last step. Other questions, please. So you said uh, that uh, so far, I mean, this, there's there's been no case where you could show this quantity is positive while there was nothing known about uh, about logic. You need to use yourself in the next. Now, you know, in the case of services, there's been all these uh, new results. Uh, it's a generic density of periodic orbits and so on, the periodic flow mm -hmm. So I guess you could define your quantity with periodic flow. Uh, I'll talk to you. I'll, it's one thing I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, I want okay. to look at that and see. So, so if you, Yes, you can. It's not really how to do it, but uh, I think so. But um, I see some non trivial difficulties in theorem C. Uh, sorry, in theorem B. We will talk about it. It's okay. We'll discuss with you. But it's no no. What's that wrong? The binding the definition is not on this, or is uh... So the definition is non obvious, but probably manageable. And uh, so let's let me put it this way theorem E is not difficult. There's nothing deep in theorem E. This is essentially a type of, type of Crofton's inequality uh, combined with, with Jung. Uh, theorem B is harder. Uh, and Kind of, you, you really need to somehow get your uh, bars out of the uh, out of a hyperbolic set. So, so it, it requires some, some things. And I think this will be extremely difficult in uh, the so. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank uh, Victor again. So, you will be heading up to dinner. Uh,